Welcome to another Shock and Vibration Unit. My name is Tom Irvine, and I'm the instructor for this series of webinars. And I once again thank Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, for making this series of webinars possible. And today we're going to be talking about the response of a single degree of freedom system to classic pulse base excitation. So let's just think for a minute. We might have a vehicle or a package or an avionics component or some, some sort of piece of equipment or component that might be subjected to a base input shock in the field. That can be during uh, transportation or maybe in the case of a launch vehicle uh, during powered flight. And when we talk about uh, different types of classical pulses, there's, for example, half sine is very common. There's sawtooth, rectangular, and trapezoidal, and several others as well. And whatever the classical pulse we might have, we need to design our component and test it accordingly to make sure that it can survive that uh, classic pulse. And historically, there's different ways of uh, performing classical pulse uh, shock testing. And one method is a drop tower. So in this case, the component would be mounted on a platform, which is raised to a certain height. And the platform is then released, and it travels downward to the base. Now, the base has pneumatic pistons that uh, help control uh, the motion upon impact. And then there's also some little uh, rubber cushions as shown here. And the, the amplitude of the shock, the, the shape of the pulse, and the duration are controlled by this interplay of variables, including the initial drop height, as well as what types of uh, cushions and um, piston pressure is, is used. So this is the traditional way of doing a half sine pulse test. And it can also be used for uh, 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 sawtooth and other types of uh, pulses as well with uh, uh, proper care. Now this is an example of a half sign pulse, and this one is for academic learning only. Uh, this is this is not an actual uh, test specification. This is just very simple for teaching purposes. So along the y-axis we have acceleration in g. Along the x-axis we have time in seconds, and this is a one g one second half sign pulse. Very simple. So one of the questions that I, I ask students, if I, for example, if I were teaching this as a live course, is, OK, let's apply this as a base input to a spring mass single degree of freedom system. Will the peak response of that system be greater than 1g, exactly equal to 1g, or less than 1g? Then the second question is, Will the peak response of our system happen during the half sign pulse or during the quiet period thereafter? Which, which will it be? <laughs> and the answer is, well, it depends. Uh, above all else, it depends on what the natural frequency of our system is. And then um, secondarily, the, the damping also affects what the response will be. So, here we have a series of spring mass systems. This is our model. And each of these systems is independent of one another. And each system is connected to a common base. So there's a common base input. And the base input is independent of the response of each system. So in other words, the systems do not have any base loading effects, or mass loading effects, I should say, against the base. So the base motion is a ind completely independent variable. Now let's, let's assume that uh, each system has the same uh, amplification factor of Q is equal to 10. And that would be equivalent to 5% uh, damping. And just for simplicity, let's assume that each mass is the same value. So we have the same mass value uh, for each of these uh, seven systems. 
And we're going to arrange them in order of natural frequency. And this is pattern I'm showing here is just for educational purposes. I've arranged these systems so that they're one octave spacing. So each frequency is twice the previous frequency as we go onward beyond uh, 0 0.063 hertz. And, and when we do, we're, we're working up to a, a concept we call the shock response spectrum. And when we do this in earnest, uh, we, we would probably uh, use a finer spacing. <laughs> but uh, given that each system has the same mass, that m must mean then that the spring system varies from one sy system to the next. So on the far left here, we're going to have what I call the soft mounted system. We have a very compliant spring. On the far right, we have what is, relatively speaking, a hard-mounted situation where we have a very stiff spring, again, relatively speaking. And then we have our intermediate systems. So each time we go from uh, left to right, we're doubling the natural frequency. So that means the stiffness value is going up by a factor of four. And we get progressively stiffer springs as we go from left to right. So we're going to uh, subject each of these systems to a common base input, which is going to be the 1G, 1 second, half sine pulse. And I've actually got this in a video. We're going to spend some time with this video. So let's call this up here and see if my uh, video player is going to cooperate. OK. Let's start over from the beginning. So what's going to happen is you'll see the base is going to do a half sign input. So that's the base input, half sign. Now we're at the duration that's the quiet period after the half sign pulse. When I say quiet period, that means the base is quiet. It has zero motion. But you can see each, each of those systems in its own manner uh, is still having some response to that base input. And if we want to uh, borrow a term from the acoustic world, you would say that there's uh, some reverberation going on. Now I'm going to play this a couple, two or three more times. And I want you to pay attention to the system on the far left. Let's see what it's doing. OK, let's look at the far left system. This has the softest spring. It's the compliant spring. And what, you, what we saw there is that during the half sine pulse, that spring was compressed. It underwent a significant amount of relative deflection. But the mass itself, well, it's moving slightly. But the mass is, for the most part, staying still or stationary in its own inertial space. So let's one more time just look at the left system here. So there you see the spring undergoing its high relative displacement. Mass is only moving just slightly. OK, let's look at this system on the far right. So this is going to be the, at least relatively speaking, the hard mounted system. That spring has only a small amount of relative deflection. And the mass was, the motion of the mass was tracking the motion of the base, almost with the unity gain. Not quite, but almost with the unity gain. Let's look at it again. So here's the stiff system. So you can see that mass is tracking the base input with almost unity gain. OK, let's look at the systems in the middle now. Let's look at the middle system. So that has a tremendous amount of spring deflection, relative deflection of the spring. And it also has a tremendous amount of motion of the mass. So the question is, for design purposes, 
given that we had this, uh, which well, really it's a fictitious 1G, one second half sine pulse, but, but given this half sine pulse, how should we design the mounting for our system? Do we want a system that has a very soft spring? So we're over on the left where we minimize the displacement of the mass. Or do we want a hard mounted system so we have a very stiff mounting for our, for our piece of equipment or our component? And so that its response is similar to that shown on the far right with the stiff spring. Well, in many cases, given two polarities, the, sometimes we say the truth is somewhere in between or it's, it's good to be moderate. In this case, moderation would be a bad thing because in terms of design purposes, we, we want to avoid the scenario that would be shown there with the middle system. Because in that case, we'd have a high relative deflection of the spring and also high displacement velocity and acceleration of the mass. So if we want to soft mount our system, maybe mount it via isolators or soft springs, that's all well and good, but we need to make sure that our spring can withstand that deflection without bottoming out. Because if our spring bottoms out, then that might cause an additional uh, high frequency shock event that would, would occur uh, where energy was uh, transmitted from the uh, base to the mass or we just might exceed the linear capabilities of the spring or, or our, our isolators or cause them to fail in some manner. Then there's also some other uh, concerns like uh, sway space and clearance and alignment and a few other things that might come into play. So that, those are just some of the concerns if we decide to soft mount our system or isolate it. Well, what if we want to hard mount our system? Well, in that case, the relative deflection of that uh, mounting is almost negligibly low, but we just make, need to make sure that the mass can withstand the absolute uh, acceleration that's going to receive as it has its uh, uh, unity gain with respect to the base motion. But we want to avoid these, the resonant-like uh, behavior that would occur if we have, if we choose the middle system. <laughs> so that's just sort of kind of an introduction for how we can uh, use the shock response spectrum uh, for design purposes. For understanding, for example, in this case, how the half sine shock would affect the response of our piece of equipment. And we'll, we'll actually be doing some MATLAB calculations here shortly. Okay, so here's the systems at rest here. We've seen this slide before. And then we've already seen the animation. Uh, and, and by the way, you can pick up the, uh, the animation file uh, from my blog if you want to play around with that, which I encourage you to do. Okay, here we again have systems at rest. And here's just a, a slide. We've kind of seen this before. This is the responses at the, piece bake, at the, at the peak base input, I should say. And I'm kind of being uh, repetitious here, but uh, there's a reason for that. So the soft system has a high spring relative deflection, but its mass remains nearly stationary. And the, our hard mounted system has low spring relative deflection, and its mass tracks the input with nearly unity gain. So those are the responses at the peak base input, which are not the same things necessarily as the peak responses for the whole time history. Now here's the response near the end of the base input. And you can see that our middle system here has both a high deflection, a relative deflection for the spring, as well as uh, the, the mass has a very high absolute displacement, absolute velocity, and absolute acceleration. Uh, we talk about uh, des design choices we make when we mount a piece of equipment. And in terms of uh, soft mounting systems, uh, think about your automobile or your truck, you know, whatever you might drive. And automobiles are isolated via shock absorbers. So here you can see there's a shock absorber. It's got a coil spring around it. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's this, uh, some, some viscous damping things that go on with, 
oil inside the, the shock absorber. And, and this is very typical uh, for automobiles and, and trucks. And the idea is that, to say, say this vehicle were to run over a speed bump or a pothole or railroad tracks or, or, or something, or maybe be traveling down a washboard road. Well, the idea is that the, 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 the body of the car or the vehicle and the passengers would have relative, relatively little motion. Obviously, some motion. There's, the passengers will, will experience, obviously, some motion because some of that energy will be transmitted through. But, but the idea is that these, the, these springs take up all of the uh, relative deflection in order to minimize the transmitted energy into the body. And this is all well and good as, as long as the, uh, the springs, the shock absorbers, do not bottom out. Because if they bottom out, that would create an additional shock event. Uh, here's something interesting. Uh, I, I deal with launch vehicles, and this is an avionics component mounted via isolator bushings. And, and the bushings are intended, in this case, to, uh, to uh, they're some sort of a rubber or elastomeric material, but they're designed to break metal-to-metal -metal contact between, in this case, this bracket and the avionics box. So that's the key for isolation of avionics, is to break metal-to-metal -metal contact. And what's interesting here, if you look at this writing, that looks to be Russian writing. Well, this is from a Scud-B missile that was put on public display in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, as part of a military display. And it's, it's kind of interesting, this instrument shelf, or you might call it a bulkhead here, it's kind of brown colored. This is actually made out of hardwood. <laughs> which is pretty interesting uh, because the launch vehicles I've dealt with have typically had uh, aluminum instrument shelves or, or maybe some honeycomb sandwich uh, material with aluminum face sheets. Uh, that's, that's pretty typical for U.S. launch vehicles. Or in some cases, composites might be used. Well, <laughs> in this case, the Scud B missile has a hardwood uh, bulkhead or instrument shelf. In fact, you can see another one here as well. Now, wh why am I showing you a Scud-B missile and not a U.S. missile? Because the U.S. missiles are classified or for official use only, or uh, the, the, those types of missiles were not put on public display. <laughs> so you'll, you'll have to you'll have to settle for this for the Scud-B missile there. Uh, here's just some other uh, examples and concerns we might have. So on the left here, uh, this is a, a representative of a, of a class of particular avionics components. And these would include things like C-band transponders and telemetry transmitters. These types of avionics generate a tremendous amount of heat energy that must be dealt with. And it may be necessary to hard mount that avionics component to a metallic uh, bulkhead or, or instrument shelf because the bulkhead or shelf would then be acting as a heat sink for that component. And I know there's some kind of workarounds that maybe thermal straps could be used or whatever, but uh, uh, for best heat dissipation, it needs to be flush mounted uh, with a metallic bulkhead. So that's an example where a thermal consideration mount might and would typically outweigh a vibration and shock type consideration. So sometimes in launch vehicles, we just have to hard mount our avionics components. Um, there, there's other kinds of examples, too, if there's some component that has to maintain an optical or mechanical alignment uh, with, with some other component, then it might need to be hard mounted as well. Now, on the right here, we have a hard drive. So think about uh, different uh, applications where a hard drive might be mounted in a vehicle. So the, this hard drive has these uh, metallic disks, and there's actually a stack of several disks. And then there's a, a read-write head on this arm, and there's a servo control mechanism. And this read-write head has to go to a particular place and time in order to either read data or to write data. And the problem is, is let's say this hard drive is vibrating. Well, that read-write head 
might go to a place, a particular place in time, and oops, it just missed the data. So then the system has to wait for the disk to spin around one more time to make a second attempt. And that can cause something called a latency error. So that's just one of, of several things that can happen if the, if the hard drive is vibrating. Of course, there's also uh, the potential for what would be called a hard failure mode as well, where something actually broke. So let's think about this. The, the control engineer that designed the servo control algorithm may have assumed that this hard drive was going to be hard mounted to, to some fixed structure. So if we, if we were to come along and mount this hard drive via isolator bushings or grommets, that could co potentially cause some interference with that control algorithm. So it's important that if we do need to isolate a hard drive, that we check with the vendor uh, to make sure that that's going to be OK in terms of the performance of that hard drive. Excuse me. <coughs> Now here's our spring mass system that's kind of like the mascot for this course. <laughs> so we have our mass M, we have our hooks log, gives us this uh, spring stiffness K. We have a damper, a damper or dash pot represented by a viscous damping coefficient. We have Y double dot, that's the base input to the system. And X double dot is the response of the mass, the acceleration response. So this is our system. So think about how we might uh, apply a half sine shock pulse to this system. Well, what we need to do next is draw the free body diagram. And there's two forces acting upon the mass. One is the st spring stiffness times base displacement minus mass displacement. Then we have the viscous damping coefficient here. And that's times the base velocity minus the velocity of the mass. Then we have x double dot. That's the acceleration of the mass. The summation of the forces in the vertical direction, we use Newton's law. So the sum of the forces equals this mass times this x double dot acceleration. So then we fill in the terms here. So mass times the absolute acceleration equals this force that arises from the stiffness, excuse me, from the, uh, the, the, da the damping, and this other force that arises from the stiffness. And it's convenient as an intermediate step for solving this to define a relative displacement, Z. So Z equals X, that's the mass displacement, minus the base displacement, Y. So Z is our relative displacement. And I'm, I'm not going to call out these terms one by one like a college professor might do. But you can see we do some substitutions there and some algebraic uh, simplifications until we come up with the equation shown at the bottom there. Well, it turns out these two terms in parentheses, uh, we, we can substitute other terms for, for those terms. So by convention, if we take our viscous damping coefficient divided by mass, that equals twice the damping ratio times the natural frequency. And this would be uh, omega sub band in radians per second. Then we have stiffness over mass is equal to the omega sub band squared. So you, sh you should remember another way to think of this second formula here is that omega sub band is the square root of stiffness over mass. So again, omega sub n is the natural frequency in radians per second. And then we have the, the viscous damping ratio uh, shown here. This is this Greek letter here, whatever it might be. Now, if we take these terms and we substitute those into our governing equation of motion, this is what we come up with. So we have C double dot, that's the relative acceleration plus 2 times the viscous damping ratio times omega sub n, the natural frequency in radians per second, times the relative velocity plus omega sub n, which is our natural frequency squared, times our relative displacement, 
is equal to minus y double dot, that's our base acceleration. So this is a second order linear, non-homogeneous, ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. So that's what we have there. Now the next thing we're going to do is substitute in our, our half sine our half sine base acceleration function. So again, here's the governing equation of motion. And we're actually going to have to solve this equation over two different durations. The first time segment corresponds to the period where this half sine pulse is active. So here we have y double dot, that's our base acceleration, is equal to our a, which would be a, our acceleration, our peak acceleration, sine pi t. t is the independent variable, that's time in seconds. And this uppercase, or capital T here, that is the duration of the half sine pulse. And then we also have to consider the quiet period after the after the pulse is completed. So what we're going to do then is we're going to solve this equation for the relative displacement z during these two time segments. Then we can uh, back calculate what our absolute acceleration is using this formula here. So Laplace transforms is a good method to solve that equation. So that maybe that should be your homework exercise is uh, dust off your differential equations uh, textbook and I go back and revisit uh, uh, Laplace transform solutions. And I've got, I've got a paper on my blog that uh, uh, gives you the derivation. I'll, I'll show you later. So let's just come up with an example here. And let's say we have a spring mass system. It's subjected to a 10G. And that I, I could say 0 0.010 seconds, but it's, it's probably more convenient to say, oh, that's a, a 10 millisecond. Uh, Pulse. And this is a half sine pulse space input. And we're going to allow the natural frequency to be an independent variable. Our amplification factor is going to be Q is equal to 10, and that's equivalent to 5% damping. So one of the questions we're going to ask ourselves is, OK, we apply this uh, to, to a system of spring mass systems, like, like I showed you in the little animation previously. And will the peak response be greater than 10G, exactly equal to 10G, or less than 10G? And will the peak response occur during the input pulse or during the quiet period thereafter? Well, I already previously gave you the answer, and that is it depends. It depends on natural frequency and damping. And of course, it depends on the uh, base input parameters as well. So we're going to do a time domain calculation via our Laplace transform solution. For three natural frequency cases, we're going to do 10 hertz, 80 hertz, and 500 hertz. And let's see what happens with these three systems. So let's go to vibration data, our GUI package here. And let's see what we have here. We've got an option here. Under miscellaneous functions, there's shock. This is, by the way, vibration data is up to version 5.5 and rising. Let's go to our shock option. And we're going to do a SDOF response, that's signal degree of freedom response, classic base input. OK, so we've got a half sine pulse. We're going to do a time domain response, English units. Let's define our half sine pulse. It's going to be 10 Gs and 10 milliseconds. And we're going to have uh, three different uh, natural frequencies. I'm going to call up a word pad here. You'll, you'll see why I'm doing that here shortly. We're going to start off with a 10 hertz system for its natural frequency. Q is equal to 10. And we, we want to have uh, several periods of response. So response duration, first of all, it, should be, it must be greater than our input duration. But we also want to have a few cycles uh, thereafter during the quiet period. So if I have a 10 hertz system, that means its period is 100 milliseconds. So let's say we want uh, four uh, complete cycles. So I'm going to say 0 0.4 is going to be our response duration, 0 0.4 seconds, that is. Let's calculate and see what we get for our time domain response. 
So the first plot that comes up, or actually it's called figure two here, but uh, if we have relative displacement in inches versus time in seconds. And this would be particularly important if we were concerned about loss of clearance or loss of sway space, or if we needed to determine whether our, our mounting springs or isolators could withstand the peak expected relative displacement. Okay, but let's focus our attention more on what the acceleration response is. So this is acceleration in G versus time in seconds. This green curve here, that's our base input. That's the half sine pulse. This blue curve here is the response. So for our 10 hertz system, Q is equal to 10, the peak response happens after the half sine pulse. And the peak response is less than the peak base input. So an attenuation effect occurred. So I'm going to go to WordPad here, and I'm going to have natural frequency in hertz, Fn. And I'm going to say, OK, I've got a 10 hertz system. And here I've got the uh, some uh, descriptive statistics here. Here's the peak positive and negative accelerations. So I'm going to say our peak. Our peak positive G's and our peak negative G's. And actually what I'm going to do, and there's a reason for this, it'll become uh, more clear in an upcoming slide. For the peak negative, I'm just going to take the absolute value. Okay. Now let's go back to our MATLAB. Oops, wrong place. We're going to run another case. So the next case we want to run is going to be at 80 hertz natural frequency. So let's go natural frequency, 80 hertz. Um, we can turn down the duration a little bit. So I'm going to do 100 milliseconds. Everything else is the same. So let's see here. We got it. Here's our relative displacement. So that's uh, coming down a bit relative to the 10 hertz case. Now here is our acceleration response. So actually the green curve is the base input. It's the half sine. So we have acceleration in G versus time in seconds. And the blue curve is the response. In this case, the peak response is higher than the peak input. So we have amplification occurring. And we might also note that the peak positive response happens at a point where our base input is still active. So it happens during the half sine pulse. So then the, the peak responses for peak positive, peak negative are shown here, up in the right corner there of the title. And we can also pick off those values down here. So I'm going to copy and paste those into WordPad. And let's run a time domain response for the next case, which is 500 hertz. Well, this will be a much uh, higher frequency, so the period, we can turn our a period down. Or when I say period, our response duration. Let's just go to 40 milliseconds, maybe, or 0 0.04 seconds. Everything else remains the same. 500 hertz natural frequency. And you can see in this case, the and when we look at our acceleration responses, well, OK, here's, here's the relative displacement. And this slide didn't come out very well. Very well. It's actually a, a times 10 to the minus 4 up there. Uh, but, but the bottom line is that this is a, a very small relative displacement. And here's the acceleration response for our 500 hertz system. So we have acceleration in G versus time in seconds. And the response is almost tracking the base input with unity gain. Not quite, but almost. And the peak response is just very slightly higher than the peak base input. And after the half sine pulse is over, there's a little bit of reverberation going on, but pretty minor, almost negligibly low. <clears throat> 
So for our 500 hertz system, we're going to copy and paste these response numbers here. So we have uh, three natural frequency coordinates with the corresponding peak positive and peak negative values there. Well, we're going to run this script one more time. In this case will be a little bit different. We're going to do a shock response spectrum. Uh, half sine pulse is the same for our base input. Q is still equal to 10. And we're going to use English units. And we're going to start our natural frequency at 10 hertz. And let's go up to, oh, maybe, let's say, 1,000 hertz. So these frequencies are now going to be natural frequencies. Hit the Calculate button. Get a couple of plots that come up here. And this is going to be an SRS, a shock response spectrum. And a shock response spectrum has an x-axis that is natural frequency in hertz. And I'm very particular about the labeling on the x-axis. This should be natural frequency in hertz, not frequency in hertz. So please put that adjective, natural, on that, on that uh, label there for your x-axis. Because otherwise, if we just put frequency in hertz, this plot would be misleading. OK, the y-axis, we have peak relative displacement in inches. We have our peak positive, the blue curve, our peak negative, the green curve. And when I say peak negative, we've, we've taken the absolute value. And this is showing, this, showing us that the lower the natural frequency, the higher the relative displacement. So if we're designing our system to withstand that uh, 10 g, 10 millisecond half sine shock pulse, this would be useful f for us in terms of design, in terms of how we want to uh, select our mounting structure to get the desired natural frequency. Because relative displacement will most likely be a constraint of some sort. So to minimize relative displacement, we should have a very stiff mounting, which would, would give a very high natural frequency. If we, if we have a, a very low natural frequency, we get our high relative displacement. There's another uh, shock response spectrum metric called the pseudo-velocity SRS. And we're going to be talking more about these later on. And there was a, an engineer by the name of Dr. Howard Gaberson who wrote a series of papers and, and kind of devoted a good portion of his career to uh, making the argument that damage, uh, potential damage and, and stress correlated much more closely with velocity, with this so-called pseudo-velocity, than with either acceleration or relative displacement. So this is pseudo-velocity in inches per second along the y-axis, and natural frequency in hertz along the x-axis. And the way to calculate pseudo-velocity from relative displacement, actually what we would do is we would calculate the relative displacement SRS. We do that first. And then as we go along these curves, as we go frequency by frequency, we multiply by omega sub n. So that's omega sub n is 2 pi times the natural frequency. So we go along these curves at frequency by frequency, multiplying by omega sub n. And that transforms the relative displacement SRS into a pseudo-velocity SRS. And you can see here that uh, at, at this low frequency end, there's kind of a plateau effect. So that implies that we have a constant of velocity, SRS, at, at this low frequency, at this low natural frequency end. Which, by the way, turns out to be a, a slope in the acceleration SRS, which you now see here, of 60 dB per octave. So we have acceleration, shock response spectrum, Q is equal to 10, peak acceleration in G, natural frequency in hertz, and we've got this uh, 60 dB per octave slope here. The blue curve is the peak positive. The green curve is the peak negative. Of course, it's the absolute value of the negative. And this shows us that uh, kind of our worst case scenario for acceleration would be somewhere around 80 to 90 hertz. Or maybe we should say from 70 to 90 hertz. 
that would give us our highest uh, peak acceleration. And I think if we take a ratio of the peak and divide by that uh, 10g base input, the scale factor comes out to be about 1.65. And that's, a, a, of course, corresponding to q is equal to 10 case. Now, as we go to higher and higher natural frequencies, these two curves diverge. Because at higher natural frequencies, our mass is tracking our base input, which is a one-sided pulse, with almost a, a, a unity gain. So in that case, there's very little negative response. Um, let's kind of let's go back to this table of numbers here. So we made this little table of numbers here, and let me uh, turn on the cursor. And I said, okay, at 10 hertz, peak positive from our time domain calculation is uh, 3.69. So if I if I do my cursor there, uh, yeah, yay, verily, I get uh, uh, 10 hertz natural frequency, 3.69 g peak response. So what the SRS calculation has done is sort of a data reduction. It's, 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 it's calculated all of the time histories for each natural frequency of interest, but it only retains the peak positive and peak negative value for each of the response time histories, and then after that it just discards the time history. So there we have our 10 hertz, 3.69 g point. Let's go up to 80 hertz. So at 80 hertz we have 16.51 g. Okay, that corresponds uh, to one decimal place accuracy with our number we have in our uh, table here. Then at 500 hertz, let's see if I can, I might not have a point exactly at a 500, but uh, let's see if we can come kind of close anyways. Well, you can see pretty much it's about uh, uh, less than 11 G, so somewhere in the range from 10 to 11 Gs is what we expect around 500 hertz. And we get 10.4 Gs and that, uh, at 500 hertz from our time domain calculation, so that checks out. And if we were interested, we could do the same thing with the green curve, which is the absolute value of the peak negatives. And we would see that uh, there are three points along the green curve that correspond with the with this little table we put together here. Um, so there, you know, there, there, there's trade-offs. If, if, if we can kind of park all these three plots on the same screen here, if we want to, to minimize our acceleration response, our natural frequency should be as low as possible. Well, that's a, a worthy goal, but the trade-off is the lower we go in natural frequency, the higher relative displacement we, our system will be subjected to. On the other hand, if we want to minimize relative displacement, we should have our natural frequency as high as possible. And that's going to give us kind of a unity gain effect here for our peak positive response. So there's, there's always trade-offs as we go about uh, uh, picking out what kind of mounting bracket or mounting isolators or springs or whatever. There, there's practical engineering trade-offs. And of course, uh, if we want to follow the Howard Gaberson approach, we would also uh, take a look at the pseudo-velocity response, which we'll talk about uh, in upcoming webinars in earnest. Uh, another kind of question that sometimes people ask me is, why are, this little, why are these little local peaks and, and, and valleys, what's going on with those along the way? That's kind of odd, isn't it? And I'm just going to do a little exercise. This is not in the PowerPoint slides, but uh, uh, you can just sort of follow along as I do this. Let's go ahead and, and, and generate a half sine pulse in the time domain. So we're going to generate a half sine pulse. And let's let it be our same one we've been working with. It's going to be a 10G, and it's going to be a, uh, a 10 millisecond. So this, this I have to do seconds here. 0 0.01 seconds. Pre-pulse duration I'll put a zero. And in order to get a good uh, result from what I'm trying to show you, I'm going to have to uh, take this pulse-pulse duration and make it uh, somewhat arbitrarily long. So let's say we've got a, uh, a five-second post-pulse duration. And our sample rate I'll put at uh, 10,000 samples per second maybe. <clears throat> 
Let's see. We're going to do an FFT of this, so we're, we should have two to the nth power. But uh, oh well. Let's just go with this. Let's uh, let's go ahead and calculate. So here's our half sine pulse. Well, since I'm going clear out to five seconds, our half sine pulse just looks like a, a, a straight uh, single blue line. But if we if we zoomed in enough times, you'd see that uh, it is in fact a half sine pulse. Uh, let's go ahead and output this. I'm just going to call this half sine. I'll just do all one word. This will be output to the MATLAB workspace. Okay, let's do an, an FFT of our half sine pulse. So we've, in previous webinar units, we've learned how to do an FFT. So preload it into MATLAB. Beam removal. In this case, we're going to do no. We've got a one-sided half, a one-sided half sine pulse. Beam removal, no. Window rectangular. Let's plot up to. Uh, maybe 2,000 hertz. Y-axis is going to be, well, it's just going to be, yeah, it will be peak, but I'm just going to put acceleration G. So this is going to be the fast Fourier transform of our half sine pulse, where we generated a half sine pulse in the time domain. And we've run fast Fourier transforms before in previous webinar units. So Let's go right here just to the magnitude plot. So we have Fourier transform magnitude. We've got acceleration in G versus frequency in hertz. And you can see it's, it's the, the frequency content of this half sine pulse is such that there's these little local peaks and dips as we go on to higher frequencies. So it's these little local peaks and dips in the Fourier transform magnitude that show up in the SRS as well. And let's see if we can uh, uh, maybe replot this in terms of some different units, or excuse me, different uh, limits, I should say. So let's just go up to, say, 200 hertz. It's actually going to do a recalculation. I need to put in a, a replot button, but oh well. Now, here, here's just sort of some characteristics of this half sine pulse in terms of its energy. Uh, some people think, OK, if we take a a Fourier transform of a half sine pulse, it should just be a distinct spectral line. No, that's not true. <laughs> Instead, it, it's, it, there's a broad band of energy, particularly at the low frequency range, or domain, I should say. So if, if we looked up, if, 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 we, if, we, if we go down into this very uh, low, lower region of our, of our frequency range, it's almost acting like it wants to be white noise. Well, but it's not white noise. <laughs> Instead, there is a roll-off effect. So uh, th there may be some analogy here to, to band-limited white noise. I'd have to, to think about that a little bit. But, but, but the point is the half sine pulse is very effective at exciting uh, structures over a wide frequency domain. And that has to do because of its energy content, which you can see uh, by taking the fast Fourier transform. I might just play around with this one more time. Our Nyquist frequency is up at 5,000 hertz. Let's go all the way to the Nyquist frequency. Here's our magnitude and phase plot, which we typically ignore. And it might be kind of just, let's go ahead and save this to our, our, our workspace. This just the FFT magnitude. I'll, I'll just call it FFTM. And you'll see why I'm doing this here uh, shortly. Now, we can go to our, our plotting utilities. And let's just do our, our multiple curves, even though we have one curves under our plotting utilities. And let's do FFTM. This is our Fourier magnitude. And this time, we're going to make it a log-log plot. So it's going to be frequency in hertz, the y-axis is going to be uh, peak g's, peak acceleration in g's. Well, actually, let's say acceleration g. That's a little more proper. Uh, make it figure 7. So we have FFT, half sine pulse. Select curve 1. 
Okay, we should be good to go here. <laughs> and here's how that FFT magnitude looks in log log format. And it looks like because of some dropouts, we have more decades than we uh, possibly could ever need. So we can go and put this manual limits and go from a minimum of, say, 1e to the minus 0, 0,5 up to 1. Okay, that's looking a little better. Um, we might do this something similar with our x-axis. Let's start at 1 hertz and go up to, say, 1,000 hertz maybe. Hmm. Anyways, what, what you can see here at the very low frequencies in log-log format, this is almost a flat plateau, not quite. And then we have a roll-off effect. And then here you can see those little local peaks and valleys along the way. And that's just characteristic of a half sine pulse. Okay. So let's see. So what we, we've learned how today how to do a, a half sine pulse. And we can do, as a base input, we can do time domain calculations and shock response spectrum calculations to see how a, a single degree of freedom system or an array of single degree of freedom systems will respond to that base input. So that's the main thing we've learned today. And this, this again, this function is called classical underscore pulse underscore base underscore input, version 1.4. And let's just briefly go back to our PowerPoint slides here. So here's our, our, our single degree of freedom response to half sine base input. This is the function that we've run. And you've seen this plot before. This is the case where we have our 10G, 10 millisecond half sine base input. And this is the 10 hertz, Q is equal to 10 response. And I demonstrated uh, this to you in class. Then moving on up to our 80 hertz natural frequency response where we get uh, almost a resonant-like amplification. And if we take this ratio here, into the maximum acceleration, and divide by 10g, the base input peak, that's a ratio of 1.65. And again, that uh, depends on the Q value. So that's going to be the peak response for any, any single degree of freedom system to, to a particular half sine base input, assuming Q is equal to 10. And then we have the 500 hertz response, where our, our single degree of freedom oscillator is tracking the base input almost with a unity gain. And then we took those numbers and we put them in a table. I, I demonstrated these just in a quick, simple WordPad table. But here's a little more neat and tidy presentation of the uh, three natural frequency cases. And then we went to our, our SRS, our, our calculation. This is using the classical pulse base input function uh, within the vibration data GUI package. And we did a shock response spectrum calculation. And we came out with a plot uh, similar to the one shown here in the slide. Again, always remember to label your shock response spectrum plots as natural frequency. Otherwise, we, someone would take a look at this plot, and if it was just frequency, they might mistake it for a Fourier transform. And let's also, another one of my pet peeves is uh, we, we need to put our Q value, or if you prefer, the equivalent damping ratio. One or the other needs to be put in the title of this plot. Uh, so many times I've seen SRS plots without any Q value noted, and that's just not right. <laughs> OK, so what I'd like you to do for your homework is repeat the examples I've shown you in this presentation. And you can, you can also do other types of uh, pulses. Of course, in, in our class, we did a half sine pulse. But I'd also like you to do this for a terminal sawtooth pulse and see what, what are the similarities and differences between those uh, two types of pulses. So let's see, just to. Closing out here, let's go to our, um, just want to show you one thing over at the vibration data blog. Uh, 
So if we go to S, if we go to SRS, let's put classical polls, classical webinar. Okay, so this is the webinar we've just done, Unit 23. And if you scroll down, there's a couple things I'd like you to take a look at. If, if you'd like to access that animation video that we looked at at the, at the uh, very uh, first of our webinar today, you can go to this link here. And you can uh, download this. It's in an AVI format. So if you want to just play around with it or demonstrate it to your colleagues, uh, you, you can do so. Now, if you're very, if you're really motivated, and you're the kind of person that uh, does not like to be spoon-fed uh, equations, you'd rather get in and see what all the nuts and bolts are. Uh, you can go to this link here for Laplace transforms, and I've got some Laplace transform tables and partial fractions tables and Bessel functions, a few other things, and I've got a a paper, a tutorial paper here called The Response of a Single Degree of Freedom System Subjected to a Classical Pulse Based Excitation. And this is actually going to be for the ha case of a half sine pulse. You can download that PDF. It's got the derivation. It's got Laplace transforms. It's got partial uh, fraction expansions and, and, all, and all those uh, those goodies. So I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you again next time. So thank you and goodbye.